Good to be in a Bible teaching church and I hope you've got your Bibles with you this morning. Open to John chapter 1. I want to read just a little bit from verse, from chapter 21. Thomas said unto him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John here tells us the reason for writing the book. This book is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The word believe in the book of John is recorded nearly 100 times. Believe not about but in or into Jesus. The word believe means to four things, trust in, rely on, obey and follow. Oh, there are plenty of people who believe about Jesus. We need to believe in Jesus and trust in, rely on, obey, follow. That's God's purpose for us now and that's the only way we will have the life that Jesus offered us, life abundant. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We will not have that unless we trust in, rely on, obey and follow. In this first chapter of this wonderful book, John refers to ten names given to our Lord. Ten names. Um, there might be somebody here who says uh, you mustn't have ten points in the sermon, you should only have three. And uh, uh, I'm rather fond of uh, a fellow called Donald Prout. He once said that he was told in, in, in uh, theological college that you should only have three points in a sermon. He said, rubbish. He said a sermon should have as many points as a hedgehog and a kick like a mule to finish. <laughs> well, you won't get that this morning. We've got ten names given to the Lord. Let's find them and mark them. You may have heard some of this before, but we haven't exhausted this chapter. In a wonderful way, John expands on these names, amplifying the depth of them and the meaning right throughout the book of John. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come to your word this morning, teach us by your spirit. Help us to hear the, the voice of you, the Lord, speaking to us. Not the words of Graham Furlong. Help us to hear what you want us to know from these blessings in the book of John. Amen. The first name, you'll find it very easily in the first verse. Jesus is the Word. Our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, always was part of the triune Godhead. You'll find in the book of Genesis, in chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man. Jesus was there right in the beginning, part of the triune Godhead. So often we think of God in terms of men and not as God at all. The Word of God can satisfy the smartest academic and the Bushman 
from Papua New Guinea. God is able to meet the need of everybody through his word. The creator, Lord, is the logos, the word. As the word, Jesus is the educator, the revealer, the communicator of the Godhead. Jesus is the word. Name number two, Jesus is life. Verse four. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way, truth, and life. There is no other. <clears throat> In John 5, verse 26, we find that as the Father has life in himself, so the Son has life in himself. They're not dependent on a source, on a, a reason, on a sustenance. We are. God isn't. Jesus isn't. Um, the animal kingdom isn't. Our garden isn't. I noticed my wife out watering the garden um, yesterday. Our gardens need sustenance and water and air and fertiliser and ground and goodness knows what. God and Jesus do not uh, have life in themselves. The author of eternal life. He is the author of resurrection life. Only Jesus. If we take the word life or live in John's book, we'll find it there 55 times in an unfolding doctrine, a, a gradual uh, fulfilling of the word life. That's the divine truth. Jesus is life. The life comes through faith in him. It's eternal. In chapter 3, whoever believes has eternal life here and now. This is not something after we die, pie in the sky when you die. Eternal life starts now. Chapter 4. Life is a spring, a fountain within. It's uh, personal satisfaction touching others. Somebody spoke to me this morning about praying for Thorn and Lun. You know, they were very, very sick a week or so ago. And if they'd have died, the whole printing press, thousands of dollars of printing presses, the uh, new building that they moved in and renovated, it would have all been folded up. No more books from Kevin or Albert or John MacArthur or other books that they're printing for the people of Myanmar. That would have all folded up. But there have been people praying. There have been people with us that life is a spring, a fountain within. I've been amazed at how that works. I've had, uh, I've had people say to me, uh, oh, I, I heard you speaking at such and such a town hundreds of kilometres away 15 years ago. And something that was said from the Lord rang bells in that person's life at that time. There's a spring within every Christian, there should be, that is touching other people. Eternal life delivers true freedom and exemption from judgment of sin. 
our sins have been judged. We will have to face judgment on our works, but not our sins. Chapter 6, I will raise him up. Ah, here we have immortality. This is not life with just no doctor's pills and aches and pains. Immortality from God. Chapter 10, present security going on to eternity, the life that Jesus offers us. And then <clears throat> eternal life means going on to heavenly glorification. Jesus prayed for us. Have you read this prayer lately? Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and see the glory you have given me because you loved me before the foundation creation of the world. We can't know what it will be like in that future time. It's not possible for us to know. Um, the Bible tells us, I has not seen nor ear heard neither has it entered man's imagination what God has prepared for those who love him. What a time that'll be. That's something to look forward to. I don't know about, about you. There's, I'm going to get to heaven a, a bit before some of you people and I'm looking forward to it. Jesus is life. The third name. Verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus is light. What is light? How would you, uh, how would you go about explaining what light is to a person who has been born blind? What would, you, what would you tell them? It's, it's, you can't very well say, well, it's, it's the absence of darkness. <laughs> that's, what, that's all they've ever known. You can't weigh it. You can't measure it. We, we just can't explain it properly. But in John chapter 8 and verse 12, I am... I am the light of the world. I, I wonder if you've ever seen the enlightenment from the Lord that comes to a besotted drug or alcohol person when they've become a Christian. Have you ever seen that? And the change that takes place in their life and in their family for a wife that's been praying for years for her husband and the children suddenly seeing a new dad. Oh, I've seen changes and many of them that took place in the lives and in the children and in the housing and in the diet and in the health and in the minds of New Guinea villagers when the light of the world came into their life and into their communities. What a change has taken place. Just, just, I've quoted this before, I think. Before the South Sea Evangelical Mission moved into the Sepik district and opened a little clinic and a mission station at Barliff, inland from Wewak. 85% or more of the babies to five-year-old died. 85% died. Don't, I've had educated sillies say to me, oh, you shouldn't send missions to Papua New Guinea and change their culture. They're happy as they are. Don't ever believe it. 
Don't ever believe it. I've seen people with a tropical ulcer, bare flesh that you couldn't cover with your hand. Don't tell me they're happy. But what a change has taken place when the light of life, when Jesus has changed their thinking and their living and their diet and their way of life. I'm sorry to be a bit emotional about this, but I've met church attenders in Australia who need the life, the light of life in their life. Because we all have to give an account of the gifts he has given us and the work he wanted us to do. Jesus is light. Oh, by the way, when the trumpets shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we on earth are being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, if it happens at night, don't worry about finding a torch or a light because in God's holy city there's no night there. Revelation 21 tells us they won't need a light or the lamp of the sun. Don't worry about taking your torch. We'll be in the light of the Lord. Name number four, verse 14, John 1. He is the one and only son. Jesus is the only baby ever born without a human father. Planned from the foundation of the world age, God broke into our human world in terms of his divinity. He touched our humanity and our thinking and our understanding. There's no other religion in all of history or in all the world that has a son of God. Christianity is unique. All world religions are people appeasing their gods. We have a God who so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'm amazed at the delusion, at the blindness in people's mind to not follow trust and obey Jesus. If you don't believe the truth, you believe a lie. How true that is in society today. Name number five. Did someone wind that clock up? Number five, verse 29, the name of Jesus. There is no other name no other creed, no other person in all of time and history through whom we can be saved. Remember Joseph, when he found his fiancée pregnant, was going to quietly divorce her? The Lord spoke, go ahead and marry her. She will have a son and call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We are living in a changing culture. We were a nation that had some foundation on God-fearing laws and values. We are now seeing many people and politicians and universities, the media, rejecting, despising the Saviour, hating the terms of his salvation and God's values. But there's some good news. There's some good news. You know, we're interested in books. <laughs> Interesting book. It's about a, uh, a fellow from Egypt. You know, Osama bin Laden had 25 million on his head before he was killed. 
This man had 65 million on his head. The Muslims want him dead. He's winning too many Muslims to the Lord. I think I read a letter in church a few weeks ago of the graduate of a Bible college in Indonesia, just a young fellow. He moved to a different part of Indonesia and started winning Muslims to the Lord. He's now won well over 700 Muslims to the Lord. In Myanmar, in spite of the difficulties, we've heard of some revival in one tribal area at least where people are turning to the Lord. I don't know how many of you listen to David Jeremiah of a Sunday morning. He's worth listening to. And this morning he quoted that there are more people being one for the Lord today. There are more churches growing and developing in the world today than at any other time of history. Praise the Lord. There is a downside. There are more Christians being murdered and killed and tortured today than at any other time of history. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Name number six, verse 29 and 36. Jesus is the lamb. Oh, we've only got a few minutes to look at the number of passages in the Bible referring to the lamb of God. From Genesis to Revelation, there's an unfolding doctrine and panorama of the lamb in scripture. In Genesis chapter 3, from the sheep or the goats, God created a sacrifice and blood was shed and the skin was a covering of the newly discovered shame because of man's rebellion to God's word. And then Abel's lamb, chapter 4, identified with faith and obedience. Cain's offering, his brother, might have looked good, it might have been uh, been okay to his religion might have been okay from man's point of view but it was without faith uh, he, he wouldn't kill a lamb shed the blood of a little animal but then he killed his brother on to Abraham's lamb that was clearly substitution because the lamb replaced a person like Jesus did for us. Then there's the Passover lamb. And here are the three aspects of our salvation. The Passover lamb was three things. Protection. Remember they had to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost. And when the destroying angel came round at night, he saw the blood and passed over that house. So the Passover lamb was protection, it was sustenance because they had to have a good meal. They were going on a journey the next day and they had sustenance and it was for people. It was a personal thing. Then there's Isaiah's lamb. Oh, Isaiah chapter 53 opens up a whole heap of teaching about the lamb. The lamb was a person that lamb would suffer. The lamb would suffer for our salvation, for our justification, making us just as if we'd never sinned. Back to John's Gospel, verse 29, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. In the New Testament, Paul talks about the Passover lamb that has been sacrificed for us personally. And Peter says, not with, silver or, not with silver and gold, we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, the lamb. 
onto the book of Revelation in chapter 4 and 5. And what a change of the Lamb. We read about the Lamb in heaven, and here he is the centre of adoration and glory and honour and praise. And in this reliable book, chapters 21 and 22, in the new heaven and the new earth, in God's holy city, we find the Lamb. We may not fully understand it, for eye has not seen nor ear heard what God has planned for us, but God's Lamb will be there for all eternity. Name number seven. Jesus the teacher. The disciples said, teach us to pray, and he taught them. He was called Rabbi, teacher. Are you listening? In John 13, Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and that I am. In Matthew 11, come unto me and learn of me. That's the words of Jesus for us. John chapter 14. If anyone loves me, obey my teaching. Jesus the teacher. Name number eight. Verse 41, chapter 1 of John. Jesus, the Messiah. He was promised, he was prophesied, he fulfilled. All through the Bible, from Genesis chapter 3, there are promises. We have found that this rings bells with some of the nations and their history. We've found that... Uh, People in India and Burma, for instance, have in their traditional hand-me-down history stories of a lost book and a coming Lord. I haven't followed this through with other nations, but I believe I have heard it said that in many uh, cultures around the world, there are historic, traditional stories going back in time. What surprises me is that when Jesus came the first time, the scholars, the equivalent of our church leaders and elders, they missed the signs and statements and they weren't there to welcome the King of Kings, the one born to be King. So the population were in the dark. Uh, but wait a moment. How many churches in our country, how many people are ready for the king's coming and the close of this age? How many sermons on the end of the age and the return of Jesus, as he said he would come back, have you heard in the last five years? You remember the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman that Jesus broke all customs and asked for a drink? She said, I know that Messiah is coming. Jesus said, I am he. Jesus is the Messiah. And John amplifies the evidence of that right throughout his book. Jesus has come as the promised saviour. Perhaps soon he will come as the promised king. Name number nine, Jesus the king, verse 49. What a fascinating story of the Magi. Those wise scholars from the east that the Bible says came looking for the child. Where is he that is born king of the Jews. And remember the at the mock trial of Jesus, 
it's recorded, Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and came into the world. The great King David, King of Israel, one of the greatest kings of all time, he said, The Lord said unto my Lord, he knew a greater king than himself. I want to say, this Jesus is my saviour. This king is my Lord and I love him. Do you? Let's remind ourselves this morning, he's not only king, he is the king of kings. This little Christmas baby, he is the Lord of Lords. This man on the cross, he is the glorious sovereign of the whole universe. Just picture in your mind for a moment all the princes and princesses, all the presidents, all the kings from all over history. They're all going to cast their crowns and their funny hats and bow down to King Jesus, our Saviour. Mr. Putin, Pol Pot, the Popes, Stalin, Mr. Hitler, the Pharaohs, this baby that was born in a cow shed created time, the universe, the flowers, they're, out, they're his. And don't forget, we are part of his kingdom. We may not often live as children of the king. We may not always be sensitive to his lordship in our lives. But he loves you and me personally. Do you really love him? Name number seven, verse 51. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. His favourite name. Oh, what humility. What condescension. Jesus was holy God. He said, I and my Father are one. But he was completely, truly man in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You know, he understands all the problems that you and I will ever have. Where do we go from here? All this is too precious to keep for ourselves. We need to get off our blessed assurance and tell others. In Ephesians chapter 2 we read, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. I was hoping that this morning we could have had a new hymn on the screen, but Richard tells me it's not legally possible to have that hymn. And I wouldn't dare sing it for you. But I want to read just part of it. I'll, because of time, I'll skip some of the choruses. By and by, when I look on his face, beautiful face, thorn-shadowed face, by and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more. 
by and by when he holds out his hands, welcoming hands, nail-riven hands. By and by when he holds out his hands, I wish I had given him more. More, so much more. More of my love than I ever gave before. By and by when he holds out his hands, I wish I had given him more. In the light of that heavenly place, light from his face, beautiful face, in the light of that heavenly place, I wish I had given him more. Amen. <clears throat>